Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon on this beautiful, um, some less, S-U-N less, but full of S-O-N. Um, what is this? Wednesday afternoon. Wednesday. We are so grateful to God for an opportunity to come before you again with this project, this platform acknowledged as Project 365. I am Portia Wheatley. I am the founder and the president of a nonprofit organization acknowledged as Trophy of Life Incorporated. And we have the great privilege and the honor to render hope, encouragement, and inspiration to you around the world. Let me bring in my co-host. Hello, everyone. Happy Wednesday. My name is Takira Swan, and I'm so happy to be here with you today. So our guests, once again, are the wonderful, amazing, no, really, it's us. <laughs> <laughs> and a sneak peek, a special guest uh, in a video clip that we'll be showing. Uh, but before we get started, just a reminder to go to our YouTube page, like, share, subscribe, because that is how you help us spread hope, encouragement, and inspiration to the entire world. And we need you on our team to do that. We definitely do. Teamwork works. And we're glad about that so that we can get the job done that God has assigned us. Well, today we are going to talk about mental health. And our guest virtually is going to be Archbishop Ralph Dennis. Uh, he, has a, he has been teaching on mental health and the believer. Some awesome, awesome information that he shared. And I am so grateful to God that when um, God speaks to him. He's obedient in sharing what God downloads to him. And believe me, this has been a help to the body of believers, to the kingdom of God. Uh, I invite you to join him on Monday evenings at seven o'clock on his Facebook page for um, Apostolic Encounters. That is a time that you want to set your clock to, to make sure you join him. It, the, uh, the information that he shares is just awesome because we know it comes from God and he's an awesome man of God, very trusted in the kingdom of God. And we bless God for him. And as Takira has stated, um, we will have a clip. I'm going to play a clip from him sharing regarding mental health and the a believer. So let's get ready to roll with this. You know, technology is not always my thing, but we're going to try and we're going to do it, right, Takira? Of course. Okay. All right. We Here we go. This. Just gotta make it fit. Yep, yep. Well, praise the Lord, everybody. This is Bishop Ralph Dennis. I'm so grateful, glad to be back with you today. Uh, here with the family of Kingdom Worship Center here in Baltimore, Maryland. We're so grateful that for the last several weeks we've been able to share with you uh, matters of our heart that considers mental health and the believer. I thank all of you who've been watching us today. I pray that you've been blessed and you've been fed by the Spirit of the living God. My testimony today is God is good, and I believe that you would agree with that. He keeps on blessing us over and over again, and for that, we're mighty glad. This Sunday, I want to continue 
a conversation that we've been having about mental health and the believer. To me, that's an extremely important subject matter and conversation that we must continue to embrace and perpetuate during this season of our lives as the church of the living God, who in the past have really, I believe, forsaken some of the, our uh, ability to optimize who we are because we have evaded this conversation. We've chosen to avoid it or to give uh, somewhat flippant answers to those who were being challenged emotionally, mentally, uh, and we could see sometimes signs and evidences that there were challenges, but we did not seem in my mind, this is my own thoughts about this, to take it seriously. But in the season that's before us now, I believe we've got to lean in a little bit closer, observe the things that are happening to us in the area of our souls. Our souls, our spirit man is indeed sealed into the day of redemption, but our souls are very vulnerable. Our souls are apt to fluctuate uh, between the spirit and the flesh, uh, and frequently we lose control of our souls. And I want us to make sure we're keeping our souls intact and keeping our souls aligned to the mind of the spirit, the Holy Spirit, who lives inside of our spirit. So I've been led, I've been led to embrace this subject matter. And as many of you can attest for the last several weeks, thank you for watching us on Kingdom Worship Center, YouTube and Facebook Live, as we've talked about this matter of the soul. Uh, what does the Bible say about mental health? What does the Bible say to us? Uh, so I'm approaching it, and I have been approaching it for the last several weeks, uh, not from the standpoint of a psychiatrist or um, a psychologist, uh, but more from the standpoint of a theologian, from a preacher, from a man of God who studied the word, who have uh, uh, been educated in how to present the word, but more than that, from a Christ-centered, spirit-filled man of God, uh, who I believe have been given a sense of understanding of these times and seasons we're in and what it is that God's people ought to be doing. You all know that as the spirit of the sons of Issachar uh, from First Chronicles 11 and 32, understanding, um, 12 and 32, understanding the times and knowing what it is that we ought to be doing. So here we are back this week to embrace this same subject matter and to see what it is that the Holy Spirit would have us to know and understand as we're moving forward. Our baseline text our, uh, has been coming from Jeremiah chapter 8, verses 21 and 22. This has been our, the text that we have gone to every week to get us started. I think it is a very appropriate text, and it's one that I, every week I've chosen to read. So I want to read it again this week to sort of launch us into this continuation of our conversation. Jeremiah 8, uh, 21 and 22, and the word of the Lord reads from the King James translation, for the hurt of the daughter of my people am I hurt, for the hurt of the daughter of my people, Zion, Zion, God's people, his people, Israel his chosen people for their hurt, for their dilemma, for their situation, God is saying, I'm empathetic. Ooh, we have a God of great empathy who understands the way we take. That's why when Jesus came, he was tempted in every matter like as we are, and yet found without sin. So for the hurt, Jeremiah 8 and 21 again, for the hurt of the daughter of my people, am I hurt? It seems as if there have been generational experiences in this hurt that he's talking about because he didn't talk about for the hurt of them per se. He's talking about the daughter of them. So that alludes to me that this has been in perpetuity, that there are transgenerational kinds of experiences in this area. But the Lord sees it and the Lord feels it and the Lord is touched by it. For their hurt am I hurt. I am black. Astonishment hath taken hold of me. I am black. That conversation there has no nothing to do with race or 
ethnicity is talking about the, the condition of the soul. I am black. Uh, astonishment has taken hold of me. I'm in a place of mourning. I'm in a dark place. Oh, my God Almighty. And then verse 22 is two interrogatories. Is there no bomb in Gilead? Is there no physician there? Why then is not the health of the daughter of my people recovered? Is there no bomb in Gilead? Then there's a pause. Is there no physician there? Sort of a two-part question. Is there no is there no bomb in Gilead? Is there no physician there? Um, that, that says to me in the season we're living in, uh, has the church no medication? Is there no remedy? Is there no solution? Mm, is there no health care for those who are suffering? Is there no care provider? Is there anyone who can provide for them what's needed? Is there no bomb in Gilead? Is there no physician there? Uh, and, and, and then the second question, can, why then? So there has to have been uh, a suspected response, an anticipated response between those two interrogatories um, because one seems to feed off of the other. Is there no bomb in Gilead? Is there no physician there? And then the, the, the uh, next question becomes, why then? That why then almost sets that whole verse up as a hypothesis. Uh, if then, if then, if there is a physician, if there is bomb, then why? Why isn't it being effective? Why isn't it being realized? Why aren't they being employed? Why aren't they being deployed? Why then is the condition of the health of the daughter of my people not recovered? Why aren't they in better shape? And, and if we apply this to modern day church, if we apply this to the current age in which we're living, why is the church in the unhealthy state that it's in? Why are not we healthy spiritually, soulishly, and physically? And we know the physical man is from the dust. He's but dirt, as David said. So he's going to return back to the dirt. He's going to decay. Time will bring decay in these physical bodies, which are but dust. But the soul and the spirit live forever. They're eternal. So we should not be seeing the same kind of detriment in the soul and in the spirit as we're seeing in the physical man. So why then, if there's a bomb in Gilead, if there are solutions to the deteriorating health of the church, Lord Jesus, I feel this in my spirit. I hope you're, you're hearing me. Why are we in the condition we're in? Is it because the bomb is not being utilized? Is it kept on the shelf and nobody has access to it? Is it because leadership don't know how to make an application of it? What is it? What is it? Why is the health of the daughter of my people not recovered? That simply says to me, when we say it's not recovered, that means that we have been in this status for a while. And if the bomb was applied, if a physician was uh, uh, released to do what they're called to do, then the status, the state of his people should not have remained as it has. That's the word of the Lord. That's our baseline text. And that's what I want you to sort of meditate on, get it in your spirit week after week after we explore this by the grace of God so that we can do our part with God's help to bring the church to a status of greater mental and emotional health. Now, most of you know that for the last several weeks, we have used the story uh, of the 2021 uh, Olympics uh, as part of our background uh, when we have studied Simone Biles. She has been our target subject uh, to give us a baseline to draw from. And um, you, you know the story of uh, how uh, she chose on June the 27th to withdraw from the Olympics uh, as the key uh, most awarded gymnastics uh, a performer for the United States. She chose to do it because 
of what she said uh, she had to be sensitive to her mindfulness. And then she referred to it as uh, struggling with demons, her demons. Um, and I don't like to necessarily use that word because it has such a negative connotation and demonic, of course, demons sort of to reflect what the devil is doing. And I'm not sure if that term is always an accurate conversation uh, or uh, indication, but I'm using it because it's a term she used. Um, we, we, we empathize with her, even to the extent that I posted something to celebrate her courageous uh, decision to remove herself from uh, that those performances while she got her head, her soul together, while she revisited her mindfulness, while she conquered, using her terms again, her demons. And, and, and perhaps uh, she's setting a model for many of us who are always in a place of expectation, always in a place where people are desiring for you to do more, to be more, to perform for them in order to give them the kind of uh, uh, satisfaction that they feel that they deserve. And that's the position she was in. As we all know, she was a great gymnast, great gymnast, tremendous gymnast, a highly rewarded gymnast. And was, uh, it was the expectation of the US Olympic team that when it comes to the gymnastics, they would win another gold medal led by Simone, Simone Biles. What do you do when your star leader needs help? I feel God in here. What do you do when you're when the person who is leading the team, when the person who has the greatest expectation from the team, when the person who has the greatest history of success in the team now needs to step away because their mental and emotional health has challenged them to make what looks like a selfish decision to not play team uh, or be part of the team, but to be more of a selfish requirement in taking a look at their souls and the status their souls are in. What do you do in the church when your man of God, your woman of God, your, your ministry leader needs a break, needs to step away because of, of what ministry has been requiring of them, what ministry has really uh, cost them? I feel God in here. Some of you need to hear this. Some of you here, you got, I got some senior pastors and, and some uh, ministry leaders and some fellowship and alliance and network leaders who need to hear this. What do you do when you're a when you're, uh, uh, soulish man, when your emotions, when your feelings are not now incongruent with your spirit man, when there is a war going on and you know that it's not a war that's going to testify of Christ and testify of his glory. How do you continue on? Because that's the expectation of men and women who you're serving, but that's not what your soul is demanding of you. Here's what I suggest. You follow the Simone Biles paradigm. You do exactly as she did. You understand the need for your soul to be intact. If you're going to give it your best, to the glory and to the honor of God. Hallelujah. If you're going to do it without internal conflict between your spirit and your soul, oh my God, if you're going to be in this for the long term and not just for the short term reward, hallelujah. If you're going to remove yourself from the possibility of accident and peril, now see, and, and what I like back about Simone Biles, when you go back and study what she uh, made public to us, she, she said, uh, have a, was having a problem to, of sensing where she was in the air when she flipped and when she did her uh, somersaults and et cetera, et cetera. She was having a struggle uh, feeling where her feet were, how she was going to land, where in the past that was something that was uh, uh, automatic to her. She knew it. She could anticipate it. It was so automatic. But it came a time when it was no longer the norm. Why? We don't know. She says it because she was struggling with her mindfulness, struggling with her soul. That's really what she was doing. Could it be that many of us who are in ministry do the same thing and we just keep pressing forward 
in the ministry, leading, preaching, teaching, uh, counseling, uh, providing help for everybody else. When our own souls are out of tact, are we driven by performance and how other people see us, how they read us? Are we afraid to lose membership? Are we afraid to lose commitment and, and, and resources because we have to pay attention to ourselves as much as we pay attention to everybody else? Uh, I hope I'm stirring your heart today because I believe with all of my heart, many times we're driven by the expectations of people more than we are at what our soul is commanding and demanding of us. And I just want to put you in check today and give you even some Bible to help understand that um, there is biblical references to mental health, mental wellness. And, and, and my whole subject matter has been and will continue to be, what does the Bible say about the mental health in the believer? Then I want to talk about why we're in this in this presence uh, or in this uh, context, uh, Jesus and mental health. Let's look at Jesus and mental health. Let's look at more definitely at Jesus's dark night of the soul in the Garden of Gethsemane before he goes to Calvary. He's close to destiny. He's arriving at the reason why he came into the world. And right at the seemingly the last hour, here he is in Gethsemane, and he's struggling with his soul. We're going to talk about that. Not today, but very soon, probably, perhaps next week, we'll talk even more about that. But I, I share with you over the last a couple of weeks, I shared with you a picture of Simone Biles when she was in somewhat of her suppressed or depressed or stressed mood. I showed a picture where she she looked very sad. Her eyes were not focused. Um, she had her hand up to her face, face and uh, you could tell that she was not her normal joyful self. That's the day that took the picture when she made the decision that she was not going to perform. She was pulling herself out of the performance picture and that's how her soul was feeling. And But then I showed you another picture and that picture of her was seven days later, seven days after the day that she made the decision not to participate. That blessed me because that picture is altogether a different profile of her. On that day, um, she had performed, she had brought herself back into the picture. She said that she was gonna perform one last performance on the balance bars. That was seven days later. And uh, she didn't get first place, didn't get second place, but she scored the bronze, third place. And the picture that's presented for that day, her teeth, her jaws are pulled back, her eyes are more focused. She's holding uh, the medal, the bronze medal that she had won. And uh, this happened seven days later. It amazed me that it was seven days because immediately my, my mind, my biblical mind went back to the most uh, powerful seven days that the world has ever known. And that's when Jesus, or when God, excuse me, uh, took the initiative to turn chaos into order. <laughs> ah, in seven days, in seven days, he turned chaos into order the chaos that the world had come into. Uh, we Some call it the Big Bang. Others call it the fall of Lucifer and, 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 and all kinds of theological uh, 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 suppositions on that. Uh, I don't want to get into that. That's what I'm not about. But I, I believe the Bible's story is true, that in seven days, God created the heavens and the earth and mankind. And on the seventh day, he was so finished that he rested. <laughs> Lord have mercy. That says to me, if you, my brother, my sister, spiritual leaders, my God, can give God seven days, and, and I'm using seven as the number of perfection, as the number of completion. Give God time to work. Step back from me what you are doing, even though it's chaotic, even though it lacks order. If you can remove yourself and release it to God, my God, something tells me prophetically that in seven days, God can handle whatever it is you've been struggling with. 
Ah, I speak prophetically to you today in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I believe that, that, that that's the power of the resource we have, the sovereign resource we have. If he can reorder the universe, if he can reorder the whole world, if he can create man in his image and his likeness and give him an assignment in, in six days to the extent that on the seventh day he rested, Good God Almighty, he created rest. I, I, and that's another story for another day. Something he created that we should also be exploiting rest, which is a part of our mental health challenge because frequently we don't get enough rest. We challenge our time of resting. We feel guilty when we rest, what seems like too much rest. My God Almighty, but rest is part of the creation that we're supposed to be enjoying. It's called the Sabbath of God. Hallelujah. Uh -huh. Give God seven days, seven days, and watch him bring you back to a place where, again, you are feeling like yourself. You can perform again. You can do, my God, not so much what others are expected, but what God has created you to do. You can be who God says you are unapologetically. Hallelujah. And and, and listen to this. The, the, the uh, seven days prior to that now are just a reflection. They're just a reminder of what God can do when you release yourself and trust his voice. To the extent that you pull, who shall I? Listen to this. You pull yourself out of the game. You pull yourself out of the competition. Hallelujah. Nobody has to demand it. Nobody has to require it. No, no. You understand the condition of your soul to the extent that you yourself, hey, Yadabai, being sensitive to your soul, you remove yourself out of being front and center so that you can pay attention to the condition that your soul's in so that when you come back, you come back winning. Ah, uh, now look at this, look at this. When she came back, she didn't come back immediately to the level of gold. Neither did she come back to the level of silver, first or second place. No, she came back in third place. She came back in third place. And, and, and even that brandished a smile on her face because third place, you're still one. <laughs> so when God brings you back, it may take a moment to get back to the place where you were, that you're accustomed to. It may take your moment. That's called process. And all of us need the processing of God because now that she got her confidence back, and I'll speak to somebody today who need to get your confidence back. You need to get back in a place where, with God where you are assured again that God is with you. Hallelujah, that you've got help from God, that you've got strength from God, that you've got direction from God, that you're hearing God again. Hallelujah, that you know where your feet are, your feet are under you. Eto Shammai, hallelujah. And if you happen to be soaring in the space, you're not doing it arbitrarily. You know that God's got you wherever you are. Hallelujah. I want to preach this. I want to teach this today to every man, woman, boy, or girl who's in spiritual leadership or servant leadership. It doesn't matter what level of leadership you're on. This at some point becomes your plight. I'm going to stop there. I had my finger on the stop button, but I just didn't know where it, it was. Too, it was so good. It, I, I tell you, I am so grateful for that message because there is something in it that all of us can walk away with a message that all of us can walk away with. If we take it to heart, if we apply it to our lives and, um, again, I invite you to, uh, go to Archbishop Ralph Dennis's Facebook page just to view it. His apostolic encounters on Monday evenings at 7 p.m. That's the word that will change your life. And when he talked about, um, you know, we have, there is mental illness somewhere in our family, somewhere. Uh, I'm not putting that on you, saying there is for everyone. Many families have mental illness in it somewhere. 
maybe not at the level of other people, but somewhere along the line, we've told someone, girl, you're crazy, boy, you're crazy. And we need to really kind of stop that because we're putting it out in the atmosphere and you know your words have power and your words take form to manifest something. So um, some things we just have to learn, but when we know there's an issue, we have to address it. We definitely have to address it. Back in the day, and really even now, but more so back in the day, people did not want to talk about mental illness. They just did not want to talk about it. And even today, many people do not want to talk about it, but it's necessary that we address it. Otherwise, the, the problem is going to get out of hand. And, um, you know, like I said the other day, uh, and matter of fact, I got that from Archbishop himself, where he talks about your thoughts. Uh, develop your actions, play into your actions, you know, crazy thoughts, thinking, thinking, all of that, it plays out in your actions. So um, don't be embarrassed when we have to seek um, health care for our mental status, health care uh, to go see a, a psychiatrist or some type of doctor that will help us definitely the pastor but then again the pastor need a, a therapist as well so that's it's nothing wrong with that it's just where we're talking out our problem talking out our issues talking out how we can better ourselves in the next day of life it, it's amazing don't be embarrassed by it it's a stigma that's attached to it you going to see your therapist yes i am i'll pay my tithes pay my offers and i've got my money for my therapist it's important. It is important. So I encourage you, if you have to go see someone, remember we were saying, <laughs> Takia, remember, I think it was yesterday we were talking about um, our prayer closet. If you need to get in the closet. Yes. <laughs> get in that closet. <laughs> get in the closet. What are your thoughts, Takira? I definitely agree. I um, one want to thank um, Archbishop uh, Ralph Dennis for doing this series and like she said if you have not if you're not familiar with it go on his Facebook page YouTube page and check it out he has multiple videos on it that he's teaching um, because it's something that really needs to be addressed especially in the church so in the world you know mental health is becoming more of the norm, you know, having self-care days, seeking, you know, a counselor, a therapist, or a psychiatrist. And for some reason, the church, not everyone, of course, but just as a whole, not everyone has gotten into that whole mental health uh, and self-care and, and taking care of your mental status. And um, we definitely believe, you know, we're, we're both believers here, and we definitely believe that, you know, Jesus can fix everything, anything, it's in his will, but we also know that he has put people on this earth that are in that profession to help take care of you, just like he has uh, doctors and specialists who are there to help take care of your body, if your body is ill or need help, it's the same thing for your mind, and to me, mental health is just as important or even more important than physical health because what your brain tells your body what to do so if you have anxiety if you're depressed you can't physically be healthy because your mind is not is not where it needs to be especially if you're in ministry because you have a greater responsibility than someone in the world who may not have that task of leading god's people or doing something that's you know for his purpose and for his will so how can you do that effectively and at 150% all the time, if you don't take care of your mind. And I think that's something that's so, so, so important. And it's coming around in the church, I think. It's coming around. Yeah, we have conversations like this, you know, um, that stigma kind of gets broken up. Uh, but it's something that needs to be addressed in every church. No matter what your denomination is, <laughs> if your church has human beings, we need to address mental health. We definitely need to address it. And um, even beyond the church, businesses, your CEO, yeah. your, what, it doesn't matter what position you hold. If you are responsible for a lot of uh, activity, a lot of people, a lot of tasks, a lot, a lot of anything, you need a break every now and then. So mm -hmm. don't forget to treat people the way you want to be treated. If you find yourself snapping at people a lot, step back, like Archbishop said, step back from the situation. Don't um, try to uh, continue in a state 
where you know you are at your wit's end. Don't try to continue uh, to walk over and talk over and live over it. Step back from it and um, kind of like take, take a, a preview or um, a view of what you're dealing with. When yeah. I say you, we're talking about ourselves, what we deal with and say, okay, I got to step back for a moment. I yeah. Gotta step back from this for a moment. I definitely agree. And a lot of times, especially if you have any type of responsibility where you're in any type of position, uh, you know, sometimes you get so, so busy, <laughs> you don't really realize the things that you've been through. So for example, um, you know, we have COVID going on and a lot of people have passed away that we know, loved ones, friends, people we, we've known, but maybe not, you know, too closely, but all those things kind of affect us. And we may not even realize that if we don't take the time out to grieve, you have to take the time out to mourn and realize that, you know, hey, this is not our norm. We're going through something globally and we have to address how that how that's affecting our mental health. Um, now, I have a therapist. I, I will say I'm not ashamed of it. And I think everyone should at least have a, a yearly checkup. Just how you have a checkup every year to, you know, for a physical with your doctor, I feel like you should have at least one yearly checkup with a therapist or a counselor just to see how you're doing mentally. Um, and I was talking to my therapist and she said, hey, do you know you've experienced a lot of loss in the past two years and I don't think you're dealing with that. And I said, no. And she was right though. I had to think about it. Like, oh my gosh, in, in four months, five months time, my grandma passed away, my, my sister passed away, my uncle passed away. You know, we had friends at church that passed away. And Sometimes when things like that are happening back to back to back to back, yeah. you kind of get numb to it, but it still affects us. And I'm, and I'm just saying this because I know a lot of people out there, whether you're in church or not, have been through this and it's easier to, to, to get through those stages that you need to get to when you have someone to talk to. So I just want to encourage everyone to do that. Um, mental health is just so important. It, it yes. really, it really, really is, especially for our leaders, especially in church. You know, I like when Bishop said, um, a lot of times we are driven by the expectations of people. That's something everyone can relate to, whether you're in ministry or not. And when you are driven by the expectations of people, you're really not taking care of what you need to take care of for yourself. You don't have time to because you're trying to live up to someone else's expectations. So it's good to take that time out to rest. And we need to, you know, normalize resting. Resting is okay, especially in America. You know, we're, come on, we got to get going. Mm -hmm. No, it's good to take time to rest. You need to get that confidence back. He said, be assured that God is with you. Yes. That was, yes. That's something that's Woo. so strong. When you are going through things, and I'm telling you, you just need to take a step back to look at what is going on in your life. And then mm. just realize, hey, God has got, I always say that God's got your back. He's got your back. And when you know that, you know, mentally, you're stronger. Mm -hmm. so. And you're in, in your stress level lessons it, it it goes down because you step back and allow god to take control yeah and it works every time every time and let me put this point out there as well as things are here in america look look at the other countries that don't even can't even actually deal with mental health and getting help right now because everything mm -hmm. else is topsy-turvy now even in the u.s and it, let's let's talk about Maryland. As well as things are right now, we we think about those in uh, New Orleans, Louisiana, dealing with Ida. Now the people that are what we call normal, you know, they they have their issues going on. But what about the men, those with mental illness? What in the world are they doing now? When you really think about it. Mm -hmm chaos on type on top of mental illness mm -hmm. they can't even deal with everyday issues let alone mm, let alone you know the, this chaos that's come on them so again as i've stated it is our responsibility to pray 
It is our responsibility to pray for ourselves, of course, that's a given, but pray for others. Think about others. Think about others that don't have it as well as we have it. Think about others who are in um, living in chaos, living in trouble, have issues to deal with. And uh, not just adults, children, teenagers, mm -hmm. young adults, college age, all of the, is in every stage there is mental illness. And again, it is our responsibility to pray for them. All right. I pray in Jesus name that you would take this video, this broadcast, this Facebook live and share, tag, comment. I may not get to respond to every comment, but I'm able for 365 days, you know, I got a whip, 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 but I get a chance to glance at them. And I so, so appreciate the fact that you make comments, you encourage Takira and I that we can do what God has placed in our hands to do. And that is to bring you hope, encouragement, and inspiration every day. And today is our 244th consecutive Woo! day that we brought you a message of hope, encouragement, and inspiration is only by God, only by God's grace. At Archbishop statement, God gives us grace for what, Takira? Our assignments. Everyone, everyone. So we're going to leave you on today. Please come back tomorrow. We have a great guest who will mount this global platform to bring you a message of hope, encouragement, and inspiration. God bless you until we see you again on tomorrow.